The expat support network and services for Spain. Why am I doing it in Spain, not the Philippines? First obvious one is I'm in Spain. Um, but here's the real deeper reasons to everything. Firstly, the stuff we're doing in Spain is to do predominantly with processing. Um, so we've got around half a million plus British expats alone, not including the Belgians, the Dutch, the, Span uh, the French, the Germans, and everybody else. The Russians, the Ukrainians, everybody. So one of the big barriers people have is language. And I'll be honest with you, it's probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks. It's not the only stumbling block, um, but most people will just go, go and get yourself an interpreter and come back. They don't want to speak to you in English. So that's one of the key elements. In the Philippines, not a problem. Everybody speaks English, not a problem. Um, Spanish bureaucracy is far worse than the Philippines. In the Philippines, you go to the immigration office in Mandawi or wherever um, to do your um, tourist um, visa every couple of months, or you get your 13A, which is not a difficult process. Here's Spain. Spain, you have an NIE number, which to get the NIE number, you need to be on the electoral roll, which means you need to get a padron. You then also need a SIP card, which is a Spanish health card. Now, you can't get a Spanish health card um, unless you've transferred your medical cover from the UK to Spain. You can get a temporary one as long as you have an EHIC card, which is a European health uh, insurance card. But that only works temporary while you set up your other card. Because basically it's saying you've got a right to medical cover from the UK. And once you're a resident, you'll transfer to Spain. So all your contributions to the UK system transfer to the Spanish system. Getting a car, you need an NIE number. Getting car insurance, you need an NIE number. After your UK driving license comes up for renewal, you need to change it to a Spanish one. So there's another process involved with that. You need a social security number, which means visiting another office and filling out documents with other bits and pieces relating to the stuff we've already talked about. You need to take your passport along. You need to take along things like your contract for your rental or your your um, ownership you know, of the house to prove that you are actually looking to be a resident or actually living physically in Spain. Padrons expire every three months. Um, originally, they were giving padrons to everybody, which is the electoral roll. But then they realized most of the people don't actually live here. Um, they're tourists. So what happens is, like La Mata, I'm going to do a video today how badly the driving is here. Um, but the point is, the population is probably on about 20% of what is currently in La Mata this month. Um, so they were giving everybody these padrons saying they're on an electoral roll, but then central government go, oh, they've got a bigger population, they need another school, they need a bigger hospital, they need this. And then somebody woke up one day and said, but that's not true. <laughs> These are tourists. So that's why the paperwork's a lot more bureaucratic. They also do a lot more on paper, literally. Um, the UK system, most of it's done electronic now. Spain is still a nightmare on paper. And it's also a nightmare for the Spanish. Accounting and everything is done by accountants and gestors and other people that sit and do paperwork, even for your own tax returns. It's not a case of the old pay as you earn, bit of common sense stuff. There is actually stuff you can actually do as a tax return. For example, you can actually get your rent as a tax deduction. You can get a mortgage as a tax deduction. You can renovate your house as a tax deduction. And you're not self-employed. Self-employed have a lot more expenses. You have to pay for your um, your healthcare and stuff like that, your social security, which starts off at about 50 euros and works its way up to 200 and something over a period of time. That is the Spanish system. That's why it needs people to sit there and work through it for people. Um, what I found myself though is getting a padron done people were charging 110 euros in this area. Getting it done in Calpe cost 25. Getting your kids into school and all the process documents for that, 200 euros. Me, you can sit here with a, in the morning, I'll spend a couple of hours with you and have a cup of coffee, you can pay for my time, but at the same time, I will say, 
you need to go here, get this form. You need to go here, get this form. You need to go here, get this form, blah, blah, blah. Off you go. Go and do it. And if you want me to fill them all in, yes, I will charge you. But the whole point of the system is you go and do it yourself. That's why I'm having a two-tier sort of system. First one is you go and sort it all out, but you'll say, Matt, I'm stuck. Um, how do I process this? And I'll go, okay, bring the paperwork into the office and we'll fill it in for you. Um, you know, with 25 euros for, you know, an hour, say. But then if you turn around and go, Matt, this is too much. I don't want to, I can't do any of this. I need somebody to come along with me that speaks Spanish and understands everything, blah, blah, blah. Then that's a different fee. But we do it on an hourly rate. But we also turn around and make it easier for you and cheaper. Because when you go for a pad run, they give you a ticket at the door. You know, like when you go to a meat counter and you pull a ticket off and it's a number 76. That's how it's done here in Torreja area. So when you go there and you're number 147 and they're still at number 20, call us up and say, don't come for another hour. And then we will come down before your uh, ticket's due and you're only paying for the time we're literally there. Where a lot of other people come unstuck is they'll turn around and get somebody to come with them for four hours. It will cost them at least 20 euros an hour. It's cost 80 euros for them to stand in the queue. You don't need us there. Now, the Philippines is far, far easier. It's far, far more laid back. Um, so from that point of view, that's why. Um, now, I will also say that the problems in the Philippines are normally a lot more adverse. Um, issues relating to criminal activity, issues relating to people being arrested for the wrong thing, people having relationship issues and other problems that basically I can't help you much with. Um, I can point you in the right direction of a good lawyer. I can point you in the direction of um, marriage counseling even, but I cannot interfere with stuff that is actually legal in that sense because the Philippines is a bit of an odd country in that sense. Um, you need to turn around and stand back a little bit if you get into these problems. Buying a house and stuff, you need to have some local knowledge. Um, this is why I always recommend having good lawyers, but you get good lawyers by recommendations. There is no real activity that I could actually build a expat services support with that you couldn't actually do with a forum. Um, because the Philippines is scattered. There's so many islands, it's near impossible to make a collective thing where one person can support the whole country. It's much easier to have somebody in Domaghetti, somebody in Cebu, like um, Paul Whiteway does expat services in Cebu. You've got other people in different areas. Get them involved, get them out to understand you and get, get an idea what services they can do for you. But nine times out of 10, in the Philippines, due to the, the way it's set up, the bureaucratic stuff is normally not really an issue. Where there's an issue is with, with corruption and other bits and pieces which make life difficult or can do, but it's not something I can help you with. I can advise you with some information. I can point you in the right direction of some people, but I can't physically help you. Hope that explains it. Thanks for watching.